Good afternoon, everyone. So glad to have you join us on this Wednesday afternoon for our Just Communities webinar series. Thank you for taking time out of your day to, uh, to be with us and to learn and um, hopefully get some takeaways that will advance your work. We are going to just give you a quick uh, sort of refresher reminder of the Partnership for Southern Equity and our work in Just Communities. Uh, and then we will jump right into our speaker today. So the mission of the Partnership for Southern Equity is to advance policies and institutional actions that promote racial equity and shared prosperity for all in the growth of metropolitan Atlanta and the American South. And increasingly uh, outside of the region, as we learn from all of you in other parts of the world and, um, and have an opportunity to work with different communities um, all over the place outside of the South. Next slide. The work of the organization really is about disrupting systems of structural oppression. And we do this work in a number of different areas uh, related to energy transition, to land use and development, equitable development, to um, health equity uh, related to the social determinants of health, uh, to just opportunity, economic inclusion, and our organizing unit uh, focuses on uh, community organizing, and you'll hear a, a good bit more about that today um, from our guest speaker. And our impact division is uh, the fee-for-service arm of the organization that hosts our research and analysis team and our Just Solutions team. Uh, we also have a, an offering called the Justice 40 Accelerator that is a national um, initiative we um, implement with a, a couple of different partner organizations. And Yes for Equity is our uh, Youth Powered Solutions arm, which folks who were on our webinar last month had a chance to, to learn from some of our youth leaders. So glad that they were able to be with us. Next slide, please. At this point, if you are with us, you probably are familiar with the basics of Just Communities, but want to make sure that you um, always have an opportunity to, to reconnect with the principles that drive our work. Um, as we worked over the last couple of years to take the, the protocol that had formerly been um, known as the Eco Districts Protocol and adapted that, evolved it to what is now just communities. And it was very much guided by these principles that we operate on radical truth and understanding of history. We recognize the lasting impact of structural racism we commit to healing and liberation. We honor the wisdom of neighbors and the power of community. We assert racial equity as the superior growth model. We commit to strategies that facilitate a just climate transition, and we leverage public policy for reform, repair, and reconciliation. Next slide, please. Hopefully this is a, a document that now looks familiar to you as well. This is the, the cover of our PDF version of the Just Communities Protocol 1.0. It is available on our website, justcommunities.info. Uh, and we strongly encourage you to spend some time with this if you are new to this conversation. Um, and we will share a couple of opportunities uh, for getting training um, in the foundations of the protocol at the end of our time today. Um, but but please inv invite you all to go to our website, justcommunities.info, and check out uh, lots of great information and resources related to the protocol. So let's dive into our presenter today. Next slide, please. Oh. I'll go ahead and queue up. Um, Marquise is uh, his bio real quickly while we um, shift to his slide deck. So why don't we we'll go ahead and, and uh, allow you to take that down and I can um, can share his bio. So Marquise Kwame Everett, affectionately known as Skinny, which I didn't know before reading this bio, it, it fits, but now I know I'll have a, a new nickname, um, is an organizer by training and an activist by passion. He's devoted his entire life to amplifying the voices of the marginalized. He's received various awards, including the Rainbow Push Trailblazer Award, Omega Sci-Fi Citizen of the Year, Firm Grip Achievement Award, and has twice been named as one of the 50 most influential African-Americans in Columbus, Columbus, Georgia, I'm assuming. 
He is a graduate of Fort Valley State University, uh, earning his bachelor's degree in political science. He has worked all over the U.S., lending his voice and his talents to the movement for Black Lives. Where there, wherever there is an injustice, he can be found speaking truth to power. And we are just delighted to have him on our team for a little over a year now, I believe. Is that right, Marquise? That is correct. Have an anniversary? That is correct. Uh, I've been here a uh, year last week. Excellent. Well, I will hand you the reins and you can pull up your slides and go ahead and, and share with us about the, the work that you lead. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, to Suzanne and to the others, I don't have uh, uh, video permissions, but I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. So... Let's start. All right. Can you see my screen? We can. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thanks to Suzanne and to the Just Growth team. I uh, am so happy to see how far uh, Just Communities is coming. Uh, and I am just so grateful uh, to be here and to be a part of uh, of, of such a wonderful program that uh, the Partnership for Southern Equity uh, is producing. Uh, as Suzanne stated, this is actually, uh, I, I just had a, a year's anniversary, and so uh, I have truly enjoyed my time being uh, with the Partnership for Southern Equity, and hopefully through this uh, this talk, I can help you to uh, Help, help shine some light on the what is power, uh, how is it manifested and maintained, and then how do you build power through community organizing? So uh, let's start off with, uh, we must first understand what power is. Vivian Webster describes power as an ability to act or produce an effect. But here, the Partnership for Southern Equity, we like to describe power as the ability to make things happen. The ability to make things happen. Whereas we look at sustainable change as uh, being created by using our collective power. Uh, so we get so ch sustainable change from collectively coming together and using our power to make a difference. There are three different places that power comes from. You have organized people, which is organized people are a demonstration of their inherent power, organized money, Corporations and political factions influence and self-interest and organized information, mass media, policies, laws, education. Uh, I thought that, that we would actually be able to have a, uh, uh, if you have a, a question, uh, please feel free to, to, to drop it down uh, in the chat. Uh, I, I would also like to start off with asking a basic question. Maybe someone can answer it for me. Uh, what is organized people? If anybody can drop that in the chat, what is organized people? And I believe that if folks are unable to access the chat, um, also please just drop things into the Q&A. Yes, please. And to my good friend Denise, uh, a, a great advocate in her own right, uh, I am trying to, to start my video, but it continues to say unable to start video. Um, and so I would need uh, either Suzanne or, or, or someone else to, to give me power. Organized relational power. That's what Ms. Roxanne says. Yes. Let's, let, let me go back. Uh, So here at PSE, we actually believe in this a great deal. Our entire organization is mostly divided into three groups. 
We have the, the people who do the organizing, which is the division that I belong to, as well as just energy and just health and just opportunity, just growth, yes, for equity. We all find, fall under the organized people division. Uh, then we have a operations division where we focus on making sure that we are uh, getting in grants, that we're doing all of the work that the grant agreements uh, require, that we're uh, making sure that everything is going the way that it should be. And then we have a another uh, a portal division, so to speak, in PSE, where we organize information, where we org organize research, where we organize data. And throughout this conversation, I'm going to speak more uh, about the relevancy of data and how we use data and why data is actually important. Uh, so we must realize that this starts with people in relationships that that is the 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 top line of power that it starts with people in relationships is focused on shifting power and it aims to make lasting change so the first question that an organizer asks is who are my people right that what is the issue not, you know, what's going on with the issue of the day, but who are my people? At, at, at the very foundation, effective organizers put people, not issues, at the heart of their efforts. Organizing is about enabling people with the problem to mobilize their own resources to solve it. So organizing focuses on power, who has it, who doesn't, and how to build enough of it to shift the power relationship and bring about change. In the uh, uh, question and answer box, uh, could you all give me some examples of organized people? And then somebody else give me some examples of organized money and maybe another person give me some examples of organized information. I can read off one here. I see uh, Stacy Olson has added in that organized people are those who collaborate to create change in support of a shared mission. Yes. Organized people example is political parties. Roxanne added in. That could that that is a, a an example of organized people. Absolutely. And today lifted up, it, it was people coming together to meet a certain collective goal. That is very true as well. So we have a, a, a better understanding now of through Stacy and today and Roxanne giving us examples of what organized people are. So we have a better example now of what organized people are, what organized uh, and if somebody could start to insert uh, some examples of organized money and organized information. So a good friend of mine, Cliff Albright, he oftentimes calls it free power. Uh, Cliff is the founder of the Black Voters Matter movement. And why I believe that uh, uh, that is so important is because it, 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 in many ways, it is free power. For us to recognize our agency, for us to recognize who we are and our worth and our value, and to begin to be in community with like-minded people, it doesn't cost us a dime, right? Uh, so let's uh, Denise says that organized people are sports teams. That can be true. And also PACs, which is very true. Very, very true. Uh, if you've been looking at politics since at least uh, uh, 2010, 2011, uh, when uh, Citizens United came into power, where uh, uh, people could, or corporations rather, 
could then utilize their funds as dark money to put behind any candidate that they wanted to, it really changed the game. So PACs are definitely a way of organized power. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. And I want to talk about how is power exercised. So now that we have an, an understanding of what power is, how exactly is that power exercised? Uh, the first one is coercion, using strength, force, or penalties to get someone to do what they do not want to do. That's coercion, but it's still power. Reward. Convincing someone is worthwhile to do what you want them to do. And three, influence. Getting others to want what you want them to want. So in the chat, if you will, uh, drop down what you feel uh, is potentially the best form, the, the best way that we can exercise power out of these three choices that we have. Coercion, reward, or influence? Corey, that's absolutely right. Influence. And throughout this presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about how do you influence people, right? So now that we have a better understanding of what is power, how is it maintained, and how is it exercised, we will now move to PSE's own form of organizing which we call values-based organizing. At PSE, we do things a little bit differently. So before I joined this organization, I was, uh, I had been a part of several big green organizations, uh, such as the Sierra Club, uh, 350.org, the Lead to Conservation Voters, and oftentimes, I was the only black male in the room. Uh, and if you know about being the only person of the only person of color in a room, it makes it particularly hard to actually have real conversations about race. And so, what I like after being here at PSE after uh, this year that I've been with this organization is that first we lead with race, right? We are not afraid to advocate for our people. The second one is fostering agency. We believe that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, right? Catalyze relationships. We believe that change happens at the speed of trust and to build power, we must first begin by strengthening relationships. And four, leveraging data. We are data-driven. We use data to engage and educate communities and decision makers. And so first, I want to make sure that, that there's an understanding that we should not be afraid to advocate for black, brown, and indigenous people. And I like the word at the end, on purpose, right? Because a lot of the issues that we deal with, whether it be uh, because of our energy burden or because of uh, health inequities or because of gentrification or the lack of uh, opportunity, opportunity to economic or, or the lack of 
access to economic opportunity, it mostly revolves around race. That's a great starting point. We also believe that we do not go into communities and tell people what they should be doing. That is not how we organize. Organizing is done by ensuring that when we go into communities, we figure out what exactly uh, they are currently working on, what do they care about, and how can we, in essence, uh, be a part of that work so we can strengthen our relationship so that we can build trust and so that we can shift power. And so strengthening relationships is, is a huge thing, not just in organizing, but also in life, is that you have got to have uh, relationships in order to get things done. And finally, our data. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, ensuring that uh, decisions that we make are grounded in data, uh, and that it's not just something that we're haphazardly taking on, but it's something that we understand the ins and outs of. So I guess I'll take another look at our questions and answers in case I missed something. Uh, going back, Stacy said that the reward uh, better for us all to gain benefits from the action uh, uh, depends on the issue at hand, depends on the existing relationships, depends on the strategy and points, people. Um, excuse me if I mispronounce your name. Buddha uh, says influence and Roxanne and Danielle Swift are here together, I reckon. So uh, let's, uh, if, if you have uh, uh, anything else, uh, please don't hesitate to drop in the uh, in the chat. Um, and now we're going to go to the next slide. So we have a unique way of thinking about uh, the ways in which uh, we engage community. Uh, and so uh, the first one is is that our work depends on people directly impacted by inequitable policies stepping into the agency to engage in decision-making at the beginning, middle, and end of a process, right? And so it's not necessarily our job to do the community's job, but our job is to make sure that they have the agency and the resources uh, to be able to organize their own communities. All right. Number two is creating engagement opportunities that shape how public policies and practices will be influenced, changed by the wisdom provided by leaders of marginalized communities. So we want to make sure that uh, that community leaders or, or community members rather you don't just have to be a, a leader but that community members that they are uh getting ahead and in front of decision makers so that they themselves can influence them all right and due to vigorous engagement new leaders civic infrastructure and policy innovations can be realized that support better outcomes throughout the American South. All right. So for most, and, and I've said this before, but for most of, of, of my organizing career, uh, and I, I first got my organizing career uh, started um uh, uh, in, in, in 2008, uh, helping to collect voter registration forms uh, for President Barack Obama in 2010. I served as the uh, field coordinator and the only employee on the campaign of Columbus's first woman mayor, Teresa Tomlinson, 
Um, and then I, I went on and, and, and did a lot of work uh, with uh, some big green organizations, uh, work for uh, for uh, police against police brutality and a whole other number of things. But there's a clear difference, I think, that should be said. There's a clear difference between uh, issue-based organizing versus value-based organizing. And so I previously, before uh, I got to PSE, I did a lot of issue-based organizing, which is working uh, groups or coalitions advocating for specific issues affecting targeted groups or the society at large, whereas values-based organizing is organizing that first seeks to meet the marginalized group's immediate and felt needs. Uh, and so a question, uh, the critical question on the screen, I kind of want to turn it on its head and not necessarily ask, are you engaging communities as a missionary or community builder? But in this, I, I want you to drop into the chat is do you believe that communities are looking for a missionary, someone to come save their community, or are members of communities looking for community builders? Can you drop that in the chat for me? Are we looking for missionaries, somebody to come save the community, or are we looking for somebody to, to come and, and help build the community? That's right again. Community builders is what we're looking for. Community builders. All right. Thank y'all for being uh, participatory uh, in this uh, process. It, it kind of feels at times like I'm talking to myself, but uh, uh, we're going to, uh, to to keep it going. All right. So next I want to... I wouldn't say necessarily to say, but to come alongside. Okay. Okay. And so here we are. Why values-based organizing? Uh, it is in particular a Southern response to Southern oppression. Value-based organizing works to transform people's hearts as well as disrupt systems of oppression. Out of facts, myths, and values, values are most powerful influencer of our public and private circumstances. Uh, the next point is that shared values are the most powerful driver of change for the advocate. Shared values are the most powerful driver of change for the advocate. The people who shape our pub public values control public decision making, which is public policy. Uh, and so this is why we choose to uh, use a value-based organizing model as opposed to, let's say, when I worked on the Obama campaign, we used a snowflake uh, organizing model. Uh, and so what this does is, is that we organize based on our values, right? All right, and I'm almost done, and then we'll get into some question and answers. But the three tenets of value-based organizing, one, that we engage the community, and, and this is also something that we've stated in this presentation before, that marginalized communities directly impacted by inequitable policies must step into their agency to engage in decision-making at the beginning, middle, and end of a process, grow agency and power, creating engagement opportunities that shape how public policies and practices will be influenced, changed by the wisdom provided by the leaders of marginalized populations, and then finally, disrupt and, and transform systems. Vigorous engagement, developing new leaders and in policy innovations can be realized 
that support better outcomes for marginalized communities. And finally, a great quote by Dr. King that says that power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that is love correcting everything that stands against love. Uh, and that was no none other than the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And so I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to present to you today uh, about building power through community organizing. Uh, we've talked about uh, what power is, how power is maintained, how power is, uh, where power comes from, uh, um, how power is exercised. We also talked about uh, PSE's uh, model of organizing, which is value-based organizing. Uh, we talked about the way that we engage community from our side. And so at this point, I would love to step back I would love to take any questions. I would love to uh, talk about our organizing model. I would love to talk about power. I would love to talk about what your organization, uh, what your organizing model is doing and uh, see how uh, this can be helpful in your communities all across the country. Thank you so much, Marquise. Um, we'll let us see if we can fiddle around with some tech um, to be able to possibly enable the chat. I'm not sure that we have ability to make any of these kind of changes once we're live, unfortunately. Um, but let us uh, try to at least think about that for a next time around so that we can get a little bit more interactivity. Um, I would love to have folks drop, uh, yeah, some more in the chat. I know um, we have a handful of folks who are taking advantage of that. We'd love to see more of you from the audience jump in there. Um, maybe share where you're coming from. What is the community that you are working to organize around? Um, what are the, the values that drive your own organizing work? And, and are there things about this uh, value-based approach that, that strike you as something different, something you'd like to learn a little bit more about, maybe any pointed questions from Marquise. And I see uh, one question here, how do we manage power once we have it? Like, how do we not become corrupt? Wow, that is a, that's a powerful question there. Marquise, you wanna take a, take a swing at that? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things that, that first came to mind when I read that is having the ability to be accountable to someone, right? And so I think that the way that 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 we not become corrupt uh, is uh, uh, is making sure that we are holding ourselves accountable to the people that first gave us the power in the beginning. Uh, there's a quote that just says that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> And so I think that it is incumbent upon us to make sure that, you know, even when we're building power within communities, uh, we must ensure that our power comes from that community uh, and it's not something that we necessarily can tackle alone. I feel like I've just made a huge word salad. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, I think it's just it's incumbent to make sure that that we are accountable to communities who give us power in the first place. Uh, Melania Mead, many nonprofits claiming to serve underserved in EJ communities need those who are already taking actions be upheld and supported. I agree with that. I live in Clarendon. This is Mel Melanie. I live in Clarendon, Pennsylvania, home to the largest U.S. 
coking plant that most people only talk about now because of the political political of the Japan Nippon Steel Seal. USX has murdered our loved ones for over a century. It won't stop unless the current local government is exposed and removed. They are the ones accepting the good old boys' ways. Thank you for that comment, Melanie. Marquise, I made you a co-host. Can you see if you can turn your camera on? There we go. Hey, hey, there he is. I get to see this uh, million dollar smile. <laughs> okay, so Lisa Ann McConnell says, in a world of inaccurate data and data sharing challenges, what are your thoughts, re thoughts, reliable data sets, and how best to avoid communication challenges that come from data? Well, I think in a number of ways that that people can weaponize and use uh, numbers in a in a very in, in very different ways, right? Well, well, you can say, you know, well, well, let's take for instance a politician. Well, they can say, well, I won this election by fifty two percent of the vote, and their opponent can say, well, that means forty eight percent of the electorate did not like you. You know what I mean? So, so data can be used and weaponized uh, for many different things. Uh, and I think it's just incumbent upon us to make sure that we have accurate data and that we're getting that data out to the masses. Any other questions? Please feel free to drop any questions into the, uh, into the chat. Anything about community organizing, building power, uh, community organizing models. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, we, we, will, we will certainly connect with you for sure. How can we get training from Southern leaders like you? Well, that's great. Uh, so we we do uh, offer our, uh, the full, because uh, talking about values-based organizing, we can we can talk about that for a day or two days, right? Uh, it, it's a, a great uh, in-depth discussion. And, and what I wanted to make sure that I did today was kind of keep it at a high level uh uh so that i could stay in the time frame uh but there are uh, a variety of different uh trainings that we offer here at pse uh including uh an ally 101 training um and so uh if you or your organization desire to see what what trainings that we could potentially provide please just reach out to someone on the just uh on the just uh communities team marquise i see that lacy dawson added a, a question in here on how you come up with values agreements you can talk oh, about a, the process a little bit oh that's a great question uh i actually i don't want to start to uh i, I don't want to start flipping through this slide so uh but we actually uh have a template of, of of coming up with values agreements that I think would be very helpful. Uh, and I am also willing to share that out. Uh, and uh, I, I wish I could slide. I wish I knew exactly where in the slide show, in the slide show it was at so that I could actually pull that up. Okay, uh, how can we collaborate with you to show the North how it's done better? Uh, Melanie, we would love to have a conversation with you. Um, we are, 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 are utilizing this, this message and, and, and spreading it like the good gospel that it is. Uh, this question from Stacey Olson, uh, 
Uh, Suzanne, I think it'd be a great question for you. Uh, do you have any recommendations for engaging with the development community, looking for ideas that encourage prioritizing community engagement and qualitative development versus quantitative development? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, you know, I would I would definitely say, you know, recommend finding some common allies who are the the sort of uh, partners that you may have in common with some of the developers um, that are working in the community, whether it is uh, through some sort of professional association locally, maybe through an elected official who is representing the area where um, where that development is happening, or or even um, elected folks who are representing other areas that may have have worked with that developer in the past, um, are are places to start at least in um, in in being able to to have some shared connections that can help to bring you together with those developers um, to begin a conversation. Uh, and I think that as Marquise referenced, we've got some good templates that that we could definitely share with you around um, some of the, the ways to begin those conversations, some of the um, sort of exercises to, to try to establish the shared values that you may have between your members of a community and um, and a development professional, um, certainly trying to learn from communities that have interacted with that development um, organization or professional in the past as well to know, uh, you know, in a project in another neighborhood, what were some of the, the common ground areas that were found, what were some concessions maybe that were considered, uh, what were some areas that were non-starters. Um, so I, I think those are a few things that come to mind um that that maybe start to get into a more qualitative conversation um we definitely you know we we know that um that development is a is an industry that is driven very much by numbers and by budgets um and time and um and yet we do advocate so strongly through all of our work um for for rethinking the the investment of time in really meaningful engagement as something that will pay dividends in the long run. So we do think that uh, that there there are some paths forward here. We'd love uh, to be able to to get some some more content in your hands. Definitely reference uh, the protocol. We've got um, some some great action guides related to the actions that are laid out in the protocol. Um, so those are the things that I would sort of recommend as a start. Um, let's see. And I see our scholarships available to frontline community members. That is always an opportunity. So please, um, if there's a particular training that you're interested in, Melanie, that, that, uh, you would like to explore a scholarship, just feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to, um, happy to work with you on that. Uh, let's see. Marquise, you want to jump in on the next one? Adina White. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Adina White, and I'm based in Central Arkansas. I founded Black Belt Media to organize information by telling stories of change makers and social impact organizations across the South. Thanks for sharing such valuable content. Well, thank you, Adina. Uh, Taylor, thank you for this. How can you ensure your work isn't duplicating existing efforts, and is this the best use of community resources? resources how do you recommend getting started well i i think that that question is kind of very broad uh because in some instances well i want to first start off by saying that our value-based organizing training is something that the partnership for southern equity came up with on this on its own uh and so that it's a it's a framework that only that that we made up and that uh, that we utilize. Uh, so I don't believe that we're necessarily duplicating uh, a work, but I do believe that a lot of the work that we do uh, it will overlap. Quite honestly, uh, and uh, when you ask how do you recommend getting started, I I, I really don't. 
understand the end part of that that question if you could just drop in the uh chat exactly what it is that that you're trying to start i could i could further answer that question um and melanie you're very welcome thank you and uh suzanne if, if taylor wants to to uh insert the the rest of that question inside of uh, in in the chat i would i would love to answer that before we go uh any other questions uh we have a few more minutes if so And I'll make sure that uh, that uh, that that some of this stuff that that I've utilized today that I get over uh, to Suzanne and the Just Communities team, so that they can also forward it to you as well to be a resource for you. Excellent. And we are always recording our webinars and um, and loading those to YouTube. So uh, those are available if you, you have colleagues or other partners that, that you think might benefit from having um, a recording of this to share with them, please don't hesitate to, uh, to share those links. We'd love to bring more people into this conversation. And Marquise, would you, let's see, uh, let's see, oh, Taylor did clarify. Want to have the opportunity to start a communities initiative? Just wondering whether you have any recommendations on how to determine the best way to get involved in your community. Is that a bit clear? Well, well, I'm glad to hear that that you are interested interested in starting a community based initiative. Um, I, I think the best way to uh, get involved in your community and we're just starting is to uh, to talk to people and to figure out what issues are important to people and, you know, what issues people care about. Um, and it's kind of something that I, I talked about and alluded to today is that when going into a community and starting something, it's, it's, it's best uh, to see what people are already working on, to see uh, what people are already doing and how you can be a part of that so that you can first build trust in the community um, and that you can strengthen uh, necessary relationships to get things done. So if I was you, I would just start uh, just talking to people, you know, from people in the barbershops to people in the, you know, convenience stores to people that are just sitting out on their, their porch in certain communities that you plan to be involved in and figure out what issues that they what issues they care about uh, and start there. I, I don't think you can go wrong by, by finding out what's important to the community that you're looking at serving. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. And, uh, you know, you, you find that most most communities, there are uh, some type of, you know, community-based organization that's sort of serving that geography, whether it's a, a neighborhood association, a community association, maybe, I know in the Atlanta area, we have neighborhood planning units that are formally recognized um, places for, for resident engagement and input. Um, but yeah, I think Marquise really hit it with the the being in lots of different places and listening and and really uh, getting involved so that you can build those relationships and um, and be among among friends and and then among you know your your allies in the neighborhood to uh, not necessarily be sort of seen as a, an outsider coming in to uh, to shape things for the community, but but really a part of the community. I would also add that uh, I, I think it's a a look at uh, look at at perspective as well, uh, and it's something that I used to say too about being a voice for the voiceless. Uh, uh, that's not necessarily true because people already have their voice. You know what I mean, and so they just need you to help amplify what they're already saying. So, I hope that helps. Excellent. Well, Marquise, thank you so much for sharing all this great insight with everyone today. 
I hope that everyone's had a chance to um, to to get some nugget here that they'll take away and think about how to weave into your work. Um, we will make sure. Um, let's see. I think if if somebody on the um, Just Communities team has ability to drop Marquise's email into the chat, um, that would be fantastic. So that if anybody wants to follow up with you directly with a question. Yes, I can I can drop it in there myself. I'm doing that now. That'd be great. Please, oh, great. please stay in contact. Then I'll put my email in my cell phone number. And, and if there's any, anything that I can do to be a service, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you so much. And as we wrap up for today, I did want to um, highlight in the chat, you see uh, a handful of links. So the one um, one thing that I'm really excited to announce to you all is uh, you may have heard us reference our accredited practitioner foundations course. Um, that is a, a really great opportunity to learn about the protocol, to get credentialed um, to that protocol. Um, just a, a, a great way to sort of signal to to your peers, to partners and clients that that you are taking leadership and in, in learning about really this next generation of equitable and regenerative development practice. Um, so we we're big, big encouragers of all of you on the line taking that AP course. And um, and we have offered it in an online um, Zoom format several times this year. We have our final offering um, as a as a live online course. Uh, October 24th and 25th. Um, so that will be the same sort of structure that we've offered um, for the past three, which is, I guess, about a six and a half, seven hour total commitment of time in a group setting with peers from, from all over the world who are learning the content with you um, in an interactive Zoom format. So we do have breakout groups and that sort of thing to, to help to deepen some of the, the conversation uh, potential. And we've gotten great response to that. I encourage you if you have the flexibility in your time and your schedule to join us that way. But we know that that is a big time chunk to ask of anyone um, within a, a weekday uh, context. And so we have been working hard. Um, our team at, at uh, PSE and Just Communities um, to develop a self-directed version of that course. So some of you may be aware there was um, several years back, a self-directed asynchronous version of the Eco District um, credential course that was developed. So we have now um, built upon uh, that idea and taken the, the current Just Communities AP course, built it into, uh, a, we hope what we'll find to be a, a really engaging experience uh, that you can do on your own. Um, so that gives you flexibility to, um, to do this at your own pace. Um, and we are setting up um, ongoing, an ongoing set of, of conversation opportunities so that if you were a part of uh, the asynchronous um, course, you will have a chance to interact with folks who are also doing the asynchronous course. So we definitely understand that that interactivity is important and we want to facilitate that and give you an opportunity to, um, to meet some folks that are also in the course. Um, so, so stay tuned for the, the first sign up for the, the interactivity um, reflection time, but the asynchronous course is live. So please, um, if that's an option that you prefer over an online Zoom, take a look at our website, justcommunities.info. You'll find that information. Um, let's see, we have the registration link for the live course um, is in the chat as well. I believe, yes, the Eventbrite um, link there. And we have a registration link also for our October webinar. Um, so we will have a guest speaker joining us from Demos. Um, her name is Aklima Klondiker and she is a, um, a voting rights attorney and um, strategist for Demos. And we really look forward to hearing from her. Um, in the the what less than two weeks before the next election so um so uh, uh please stay tuned for that uh go ahead and click the link to register if you are able and we uh we look forward to having you be a part of that um i see marquise has put your uh, email address in the chat and your phone number so thank you so much um 
Absolutely. Let's see. Hopefully, if anyone joined after some of these links were added to the chat, I don't know if you'll see them, um, but you will. I'll go ahead and repeat a couple of them so that uh, they don't get lost. Um, and if you're ever in in uh, in doubt, please don't hes hesitate to reach out to us. I had just realized that I neglected to introduce myself at the very beginning of this thing. I'm Suzanne Burns, and I lead the, the Just Growth Portfolio at PSC, and I have the the honor and pleasure of working with folks like Marquise and uh, Jasmine and Elaine, who were helping on the backside here today, um, with uh, Hadejo and Rob. Uh, we have a, a great team. Colette is working with us as well, um, and uh, would love to be in conversation with any of you. So um, we are right at our time. I want to make sure that you have uh, ability to get back to your day. If you are in the path of this uh, this storm that's brewing in the Gulf right now, please be safe and take cover at the right time. We're getting a lot of warnings here in the Southeast right now, um, but we know this this uh, will have impact in, in uh, lots of parts of the country and some ripples. So, so stay safe, everyone. Um, Please don't hesitate to reach out to our team if you have any questions or comments. Um, reach out to Marquise with further comments or questions related to the organizing work. And thank you all. Have a wonderful day and we will see you next month.